90. Um, approval of the agenda. Anybody have any late items? Yeah. No, Deb, you're okay there? Yeah, all good. You can hear us? Great. Okay. Yeah. Recommended the, the Planning and Development Committee meeting agenda for January 4th, uh, 2022 be approved as circulated. Can I have a mover? Ian, seconder, Don, thank you. Approval of the minutes it recommended that the minutes of the Planning and Development Committee meeting held on December 7th, 2022 be adopted. Everybody had a chance to read those? Thank yep, you, Dave, for moving that. Seconder? John, thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay, we're going to get an update from our development and service. Uh, uh, development and service update from Scott. You going to run through our app current applications? Yeah, there's not a lot of new applications. Um, Maybe just the bottom two have been added since uh, since the December meeting. Um, and yeah, just waiting for some additional information on those. Um, one of them is um, a rezoning because um, they're looking to add a building, I believe, on uh, DeBell that I think we talked about before um, where they're replacing a, a home. And then the other one on Old Town Road, I guess when the survey came in, the property is too close to the property line. so. Uh, new building a new home so they'll have to get a variance for that okay and they haven't started building yet no i think they've built oh he's built yeah, yeah. Oh, so that, that's the second one out there yeah that's the one that's almost on the road um no it's a it's not that one <laughs> that's another one <laughs> that one, that one down, they already got their variance Did they already building they got their variance so okay okay <clears throat> Um, any new activity on the any developers or anybody phoning in there? Uh, no, nothing really exciting. It was pretty quiet over Christmas. And okay. Have we heard anything from Pankesh uh, at the at the Best Western? Haven't. No. Okay. <clears throat> anybody have any questions on the current applications? No. Okay. Well, we'll move on then. New business, uh, we're going to talk about short-term rentals and business licenses. Scott, are you going to take this over or Sarah? No, I can, um, which Sarah is online, but uh, she's sitting at her desk. Um, yeah, so we're looking at the, you know, the, the zoning bylaw received third reading at the, the last council meeting and looking to move that to adoption, likely at the, the next council meeting. Um, and... Um, adding some short-term regulations to the, the zoning bylaws. So then we're looking to add some short-term rental regulations to the business license bylaws. We're gonna try and use the business license bylaw as the main way to enforce um, short-term rentals. So um, <clears throat> taking some of the language from the um, zoning bylaw and, and putting it into the, uh, the business license bylaw um, and then everybody should have um, some checklists, so an a new license application form, and then um, and then two checklists, kind of a pre-application checklist, and then a, a checklist um, for short-term rentals and breakfast. Um, <clears throat> on the, the right-hand side on the screen right here, you can see the proposed. Um, uh, short-term rental policies. Um, there are some question marks um, that this group can discuss. Um, we'll likely bring it to council to a committee of the whole as well once we, we have some of the stuff ironed out. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, just um, for uh, an application, so they'd be required to find the pre-inspection che checklist and the fire safety plan, an off-street parking plan, Contact for that local responsible person so that they can respond to something within by phone within 15 minutes and then in person in an hour. So that means our bylaw officer is not the one going out enforcing noise complaints or parking parkings. Someone who owns the property or is, or is responsible for the property is going out and addressing those issues. So it's not the district that's that's responding to those types of complaints. Um, <clears throat> Uh, list of booking platforms and other advertising. So we just want to know where people are advertising. So, you know, if we do, 
get multiple complaints, we can look and see, hey, you're advertising for five bedrooms and really only have parking for two bedrooms. So um, help people get through that. Um, and then we have, we left it kind of open in this just evidence satisfaction of the bylaw administrator that the short term rental business is permitted by bylaw enacted under the BC Strata Property Act. Um, so we just want to, um, what we'll, I think each strata is going to be a little bit different. I know one of them has, you know, here's our rules all about short term rentals. Uh, other ones are kind of silent on them. So maybe we'll ask for something from the strata saying, yeah, like I think on White Pines. We've received a letter from the White Pine Strata saying, you know, these, these this is permitted use for these, these might look different for each strata. So we're trying to just nail it down, um, leaving it a little bit up to the, we'll say the bylaw administrator, which would likely be myself. I issue the business licenses. Um, people can um, appeal the decision made by the bylaw administrator and then come to council. So maybe that'll be something that could come in front of council and we'll look for a council direction on if, uh, if it's not working the way we're hoping it's working. <clears throat> um, but then, yeah, just the kind of other regular stuff. Number two, short-term rental licenses must list the following information on booking. So business license number, number of bedrooms, number of street, uh, of street par off street parking spaces, maximum, maximum uh, guest occupancy, and saying the number of vehicles that guests are permitted to bring one thing we have seen um, just recently um, where someone has applied, they have two parking spots in their strata, they have three bedrooms and they, they, they rent two parking spots somewhere else in town. Um, so that might be something that we can, we can look at as well. Um, <clears throat> again, just the local responsible person. Um, and then, um, yeah, having like, we'll have, we'll have something where uh, we're looking at a map where people can go, you know, like they search up their zoning, they can search up um, short-term rentals, and then they, they'll have the information for that short-term rental. So if, you know, you, something's happening in your neighbor's house every weekend, then you go, oh, they have a short-term rental, and you can see what they're allowed to do, and then, and then you know, investigate through the responsible person or, or through staff. Our goal is really to, to leave it up to the make some rules, leave it up to the homeowner to, to, to manage it. And then through that local responsible person. And then in the, the last case or the worst case scenario would be bylaw going and, and enforcing, but likely through the, the business license bylaw. So they would be necessary noise complaints that he'd be enforcing on. He'd be, you know, we're going to revoke your business license and then we can find them through the business license bylaw as opposed to noise complaints. Um, okay. And then um, the application forms, um, let's see what's the next slide, Steffi? Zoning, so this is just um, the, the, what's on the, in the, the zoning bylaw as far as the regulations and uh, the application. No. Oh, here's, here's a map. Um, so on all the commercial zones, so C1 through C6, you can have tourist accommodation. So kind of a hotel, motel, kind of the conventional tourist accommodation. Um, so that's the um, the darkest blue and then the residential zones, um, which would allow short-term rentals. That's country residential, the RVP one, which is Silver Sands and MUR twos, which are the, the stratas. Um, and so you can see those, um, those colored the, uh, Second, oh no, I think both of them are the same color, it appears. Um, and then in the residential uh, and resource zones, so you need to have a dwelling unit. So you need to have someone essentially living there full time. And then you can have an accessory bed and breakfast or sleeping unit. And so that's in the, the A1 zone and then the R1, three and four zones. Um, so really, it's, as you can see, like most of town, you're gonna be permitted that, um, that second, either a commercial unit or that second unit as a, um, as a, a tourist accommodation or short-term rental. Um, Deb, you, you wanted to see a map. Do you have any questions about the map? No, no, it looks good. Um, and just to comment, I, I really like the fact that you're going through the, the business licensing. I just think that makes a lot more sense. 
Um, I'm assuming, Scott, that makes it easier for this to be a bit of a living document, too, in terms of making changes to it rather than, you know, in the zoning. Yeah, it, it will, although I, I think I think council is going to see some applications for people who have purely like, you know, a single family dwelling right now that they yeah. use only for short term rentals and not for a yeah. dwelling. Yeah. I know we're going to start seeing some applications. So I think that's going to be the next step is like, how does council want to address those? Do we want to create a spot zone? Do we want to create temporary use permits or do you just want to kind of put the message out there? You can apply, but um, council's not interested in in uh, in approving any. So yeah, we'll we'll see that in the new year. Yeah, yeah. I because I, I honestly I think to the extent you're managing it through the business licensing and enforcing, you know, like yeah, do it properly or you don't get your business license and you know you'll be shut down is just the right way to go. But uh, go ahead, Ian. Oh. Yeah, I, sorry, I, do you want to finish? Or? Okay, uh, just a question in terms of like it's running through a business license. Are we going to require them any any other documentation like you're running as a sole proprietor or your corporation or we're just going to leave that up to them? So we, for the business license, we require a title. And then if there's a personal name on title, they can apply. Right. They can appoint an agent. If they have a company, we ask for the company, a letter from the company to say, this person can act on behalf for the business license. Um, it would be possible for somebody if if they were renting, like you're the primary renter of a property and you want to operate uh, bed and breakfast or short-term rental, you could get permission from the owner of the property to do it. So okay, but we're not we're not requiring them to set up a business entity to right. run it. Okay, yeah. Um, anybody else? Thought I had a couple of quick ones on the uh, uh, strata approval. Would it be wise to have uh, strata provide a, I mean, they'll probably have a blanket letter that comes to the district. Right. But would it be wise to have the unit number on each? They'd have to do one for each unit number that you know, or they know who's renting in their, I mean, if they just have a blanket letter, I'm sure that letter can get out somehow. <laughs> and uh, it'd be nice to have, an individual, the strata gives a uh, approval uh, on the individual unit. Right. So we could ask for that. Um, and and so, for example, White Pines has provided that for some of the properties. Um, and really, they're the only ones who've provided that. Um, we haven't had any other stratas apply or provide any information yet. So since, since the new... The new bylaws people are considering those we have we probably have about two dozen <clears throat> applications for short-term rentals right now um but we've essentially put them on hold if you will we said we can't issue them right now because they're not a permitted use yes. as soon as the new zoning bylaws adopted um i expect that yeah we'll get a lot of them will be that letter saying with the from the strata saying this unit number whatever um, I think some units are going to have a challenge getting that letter from the, the the strata council, so we'll have to figure something out. Well, it kind of puts the onus back on the strata to know who what's going on in their own building. Yeah, you know, it's just you can't have be a free for all like it has been at the legacy. And then, you know, uh, they have to get together and 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 put a board together for short term rentals or whatever it is, and and work together. And uh, and uh, and I think it would be good to have individual letter with the individual unit number. I think so that the strata would have to give that letter for us to give them a business license. Right. Okay. I mean, I see some obvious problems, a legacy to get that letter. I mean, we zoned it MUR2. So we know basically legacy is, well, it's a <laughs> divided house. And the condo board is so solely against the MUR2 zoning. So I guess they'll have to have another, like another vote somehow to approve short term rentals there. But what if a condo board just refused to give that, but it is a permitted use? Then does that kind of fall back on us? I think if we go back <clears throat> to the first slide, um, so 5.91F. Updated as evidence satisfaction of the bylaw administrator that the short-term rental business is permitted 
by bylaw enacted under the BC Strata Property Act. So I think, um, you know, I've seen Grand Few Shore as an example. I, I've seen the little exit from their bylaw and it's very clear. Um, we'll probably ask someone who applies from Grand Few Shores, hey, can you get us a letter from your strata? And then we have the bylaw, we have the strata, letter from the strata. They're all good. White Pines, we've got the letter from the strata. So I think we're good. Um, some of the other ones, yeah, I think we're going to be kind of figuring it out. That's why we left it um, a little bit open there, evidence satisfaction by the administrator. So there will be a little bit of a judgment call. If the license is refused, they do have the opportunity to come back to council and council can weigh in on it. So, okay. so the process really comes down to you being satisfied that this is a permitted use and the, and the strata has allowed it. Right. Okay. That's fair. Okay. okay. Another one on the signage. Are we gonna? Is there any way we can? Um, is there any way we can ask them to have a branded or like our branded signage? Could we provide or charge them uh, for signage? So you know you're gonna get everybody's gonna put the you're gonna have a your, your place is supposed to be posted with the with the phone number of the responsible person that you're gonna call. And they're going to have hodgepodge signs, cardboard signs. It's, it's, I'm wondering if, is there any way we could come up with, you know, maybe not the first year, but start thinking about it is uh, they have, you know, put it in the part of the business license where we have a branded sign. It's unit number five Oh, you know, uh, silver sands, the one at the end there, the greenhouse, you know, <laughs> you know, and uh, you, you, you can, that way, you know, and the people in, in town know, that it's an actual certified strata uh, short-term rental home. I think we're asking for something inside the building to be posted so people who are renting it can see like the, you know, the business license and, and, and the, the local responsible person and the stuff. I think we're more looking at like, an, uh, like a list online and a, and a map people can go instead of a sign on the outside of the house, but we can, we can look at that. I know, some places probably going to want to put up a little sign or the business or the sign by law does have some, some rules around signs for a, a bed and breakfast or home occupation. It's like a, a small yeah. sign. So. Yeah. I noticed, I can't remember which, which town it was. Maybe it was uh, been ticked in or I can't remember which one it was down South, but they, they have brand, their signs are branded so that everybody knows it's a short term rental place and the phone number, the, the contact person's number is on the outside of the house. So they, the letter the people on the inside aren't going to phone on their on themselves it's going to be yeah. the people the neighbors <laughs> next door <laughs> okay. yeah we can look and see what what they've done there okay okay and then uh, another quick one who uh, how are we gonna how are we gonna review the platforms or uh, is that what by bylaw john's going to be doing this kind of reviewing or we, have we come up with a system of how we're gonna like monitor? how someone's advertising yeah i think I think we'll probably ask them for the list of where they advertise. And if we start having issues, we'll go and review them. And it, I don't know if it'll be John, but whoever receives the phone call probably can review it. Maybe monitor them <clears throat> each year as they, you know, we have to do a fire inspection each year. Maybe kind of that'll just be part of the process of renewing the business licenses, going, checking out those platforms, making sure they're, they're advertising correctly. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. What else we got on there? <laughs> That's all I have for short term rentals. Um, okay. Deb, you have anything? You got, everybody's no. good? No, I, that's good. Okay. Moving right along. Everybody good? Okay. Um, item number B, uh, water course development. I, I asked uh, Kelly about putting this on the agenda and I've been talking to Todd because Todd's done a lot of, Todd Kylo's done a lot of um, uh, water, you know, water application, waterfront applications and is familiar with the procedure. And so we've been just lately, we've been kind of getting all kinds of information sent in, but I just wanted to I asked Todd to come today and, you know, maybe give us a little bit of an update if you don't mind. And uh, just where what you what you've learned in the little past and and some of the stuff that you you've handed us in the last week day or two. Yeah. So for me, another thing for me, but I'm getting back into it because I had to hire a QT, both of course for uh, works on the lagoon, which is lot forty six. Um, and I don't know. Maybe we can start there with lot forty six. 
Okay. Uh, there's an application right now for people who want to do work on the lagoon. And they're just uh, that. Yeah. Are you aware of Lot 46? No, I don't know Lot 46. <laughs> the lagoon down by the uh, Sickness Park. Okay. So there's 17 houses along the lagoon. Yes. The actual lagoon is by the lot. Oh, is it? Okay. It's not part of the waterway. It's not part of the, 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 there's water in it. Yeah. It's actually a private lot owned by those 17. So there's a lot of gray area going back and forth of, you know, do we need a QEP? Do we need to talk to the province? Mm -hmm. just, and in the past, it's 1970, it was put in place. We never talked to the province. We dredged it. We've done all this work. So we have talked to PFO right. on our dredging and permitting. But we never talked to front government here in London. Now, when we come through the DOS, they're saying, well, we have to talk to Flintroll and you have to get a development permit. Um, that's what one of the people have been told. Um, when you look at your guys' map, which is built by the district of St. Louis on water course development permit areas, the lagoon's not in. So, again, it's not in for certain reasons because it's, it's kind of falls under its own criteria. We have a water license through water license UPC, and attached to that water license is a management. Right. Allows us to do the work or anything kind of down in that area that we need to do. I think there's 17 or 18 docks. Nobody's asked when we to put the docks in. Like it's never, it's never happened. So I just I want to get something done in the district of Sycamus so we can move forward when there's uh, future developments or you know expansions or that type of thing. So we have hired a community and we are doing a report, um, even though I don't think we need to. We've never had in the past, but we are doing that. And once we get that done, we'll share it. But you know, I, I would like to. Uh, there's one guy that's got a stop work order right now. I'd like to see that get removed so that he can continue on because um, he, he doesn't need to go through the ministry of the federal for a development permit to put a deck on. So, so I'm hoping that that can be your council. I don't know what I need to do. Do I have to come? Council, do you have to have it here? Or what, how does it get? Scott, what's your which are you, are you familiar with the project? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so right now we have two applications for people doing work within thirty meters of the lagoon, which is is considered a water course under the Riparian Areas Regulation Act. Um, so we can't issue a building permit or a development permit without them going through that that process, that repairing areas process. Um, so the lagoon is its own separate entity, has its management plan, but all the land around the lagoon, it does apply. So the repairing areas regulation does apply to the water course. And we've we've spoken to the, the ministry and they've confirmed. Um, I know at least one of them has engaged a QEP, so it would make a lot of sense if they were working with the same QEP. That, um, to do one report. Um, the report, I think, that was done for the lagoon um, really doesn't consider the upland uses. It considers kind of the use of Lot 46, but not you know, next to Lot 46, 17 houses next to port, Lot 46. So a report, you know, that comes up with a setback or a SPIA or all those lots probably would, would save everybody a lot of time in the future. But as far as the two projects we're looking at right now, like, you know, they, they're required to get that report. And when did that requirement come into place? Because it wasn't the past. So why is it not? So in, in 2004, when. Well, in 2004, lots of stuff's been built and we've been able to go through that. We've been right. we have gone through that. So I'm just asking, like, where is the criteria stating that, you know, we. We have to have a setback. So there's there's lots of complications. First of all, the high water mark isn't vertically or horizontally done. It's vertically. It's like a bowl because everybody has a retaining wall, just like this has a retaining wall around the property. So the high water mark doesn't go like this. The high water mark goes like this. So that changes the spear. That changes the repairing area. There's a lot of a lot of changes there. It's not just like a 
waterfront house where there's no uh, decay. So there's that concern. But I guess the second concern I have is, you know, why is the DOS asking a ministry that's three years behind in permitting to get a permit when we can do it in house? We don't have to go through the ministry. Makes sense. You know, why aren't we doing that here? Like, why are we asking for a ministry that you can't even get a permit for three to four years just in Crown Porsche releases? We're going to ask them to produce a development permit for a guy who wants to put a deck out in an area that has really no concern or there's no fish habitat issues. Yeah. Like, it's, it's, we, you know, I don't understand. And in talking to the ministry, there's two different laws there's the RAR law. And what's really confusing here is we're not just a provincial waterway, we're a federal waterway. So, so the province can place all these issues and laws and regulations on the waterway. We fall under federal laws. There, there's no provincial law that's going to supersede a federal law. Mm -hmm. It's never going to happen. It's never happened to date. And so, so there's there's bigger issues than just, well, we got to deal with the repairing area. And when I'm talking to the ministry on this RAR legislation, now there's a new legislation. And that came from uh, the Ombudsman report. So BC Ombudsman did a report in 2020, and they came up with 25 recommendations that they'd like to see the ministry, Glenroe, establish when it comes to local governments dealing with repair needs. And they haven't put them all in effect. But one of them they put in effect is called RAPPER. So there's RAR and RAPPER. RAPPER is another regulation which falls provincially under. So the, the very confusing part was when I'm calling a QEP and I'm asking them for <clears throat> to come and look at doing work along uh, the lagoon or 50 meters. The answer they give me right on not even minutes. You can't do any work in the 15 meters. Yet. Like what? Where does this come from? So I phoned the ministry, like I read all the RAPA regulation, all the RAR regulation. There's nothing in those regulations that states nothing can be done in the 15 or 30 year setback. It all comes back down to you have to hire a QEP. QEP has to do a scientific based approach study. That study is given to either you guys or the province, and then the decision can be made on you know what kind of uh, I guess habitat issues are going to be done with that, uh, you know, say to put that deck in, in that habitat spee area. Yeah. So if you look along the lagoon right now, the spee area, you have houses, you have cement, you have concrete, you have something. It's, it's all in the spee area that's been developed. So not only is the lagoon low fish habitat, which we've done studies on, it's the whole area around the lagoon, the Torrance Sea area, doesn't provide a great, um, you know, nutrients or fish habitat area for that area in the first in the first place. So, you know, having a QEP do a study, which we're getting done, that will show that it's low impact, and maybe that'll help the DOS with its permitting. But again, you know, I'm, I'm asking why, but it says that in your guys' bylaws, Anything in the water course development permit areas, which this map has to go through the way you guys are doing it through the ministry. The lagoon's not in. The lagoon's not in this map. Yeah, it's, it's outside the, the zone. So, again, is there somebody here just making up regulations? And I, I, it's, it's frustrating. Now, when I talk to the ministry, they can't answer me on, you know, when did this no setback the regulation happen in the 50 or 30 year? They don't have answers either. So I do have a meeting with Glenn Rowan. I'm going to ask you to attend. With and we'll go down and get, because the in talking with QEPs, I'm asking them, we'll provide you the regulation. Yeah. It's absolutely no bending of the speed line. Well, they don't have it. They can't, they can't come. They're just coming. Glenn Rowan. Yeah. I think it's really the whole, and that's why and Kelly thought it was a great idea as well. I think that all waterfront developments, I mean, you can see it right now with the province 
and the QEPs, and you and you read some of that information you you've given us, it's very. I mean, they're trying to get retrained or trying to get trained on the, the procedures, and they don't even they can't even get the proper answer from the province. So it's not only that. I think even us here in Sikamus, we're I think we're probably listening to the province, and and they're telling you stuff that you might not even need. You know, you know. So so I kind of asked Scott or I asked. Um, uh, Todd, if is there any way we could get Keith Weir on to be online today, but we couldn't get him online today, and uh, from the from the from the province. So yeah, no, I I agree that it's very it's very difficult for as somebody that's been in the business for as long as you have, and it's very frustrating. And it, it, all the people on the waterfront. I mean, I'm I'm just glad I'm not on the waterfront anymore because it was confusing back in the '80s. Well, it's even more confusing now, and and Flynn Rose confused the QEPs. Because I asked, well, please provide me the red the electrical that says you can't build or bend the steel lines. Well, they don't have it. All they have is uh, interpretation on a guideline from Flynn. Mm -hmm. Well, again, it all comes back to triggering a hat, operation or destruction. That's why the repairing area was new in the first place. So if that if the three P signs up that there's no hat trigger, then it'd be up to the district to decide whether that development can proceed. But everywhere you look in the repairing area and the wrapper area in regulation and states, right in there several times over and over again, the QEP has to do a science-based study in order for any commercial, residential, or industry development to proceed. Yeah. Right? It doesn't say the lines can't be moved. So there's a big, gap missing between that and here. And I'm just wondering, you know, why is not the district of Sikkim's regulating its own repairing areas with QEP reports that they can get instead of going through the ministry? Because we don't have to go through the ministry. There's nothing that says we're not going through the ministry. That's already three to four years behind. Yeah. Uh, just, where did the 30 feet, is it 30 meters or 30 feet set back? Because I, I mean, I've often heard that. Where did that come from? 30 meters. It's 30 meters off the top of the bank on a river. Mm -hmm. It's 15 meters off the river. But did that come from regulation I after the federal regulation under the Fisheries Act? So <clears throat> Todd's right with the fish habitat. It's it's controlled by the federal government. So mess with fish habitat, they come hit with a big stick. That's that's the main thing. You don't want to. You yeah. don't want to wreck fish habitat. That's that's the bottom line. They control fish habitat. The province controls development on the land next to fish habitat. So that's where that's where the the regulation comes in, and the repair and areas regulation came in in two thousand four. It said local government cannot approve any development within thirty meters of a lake or water course without this report being prepared. So then that report considers the development within 30 meters, and then they come up with what the setback is. The setback's a SPIA, so the setback could be 30 meters. <clears throat> Most of the time it's 15. I've seen it go down to 10. Um, and so that's basically what it is. And it, and it says local government can't approve any development without this report going through. So if you're in an area with no building permits, um, no development permits, nothing, then then you know you as a homeowner could go and build a shed right next to the lake. Let's hope you don't mess with fish habitat because right because then you get in trouble. But it's the, the repairing areas protection regulation regulates us saying local government can't issue anything without that report being submitted. It used to be submitted to the province. Now it's and accepted by the province. Mm -hmm. So it used to be they'd submit the report, they give it to us, we'd issue the permit. But now we have to wait for the province to say, we got the report and we approve the report. That's only if you want to use the ministry as the goal. But, it, and that's, there's, and there's no other, there's no other way for us to do it. There is, there's lots of districts and cities and province of BC that aren't using ministries to go through it. They're just using the QEP reports. And they're making their own decisions. And the ministry has no legal authority, none, on any repairing areas that districts or cities have regulations on. Uh, but is there, is there nothing, maybe just a follow-up question, is there nothing like, obviously these houses are built. I mean, they're clearly within 
the 30 meters. I mean, there's no going back. And even, I mean, there's so many places that are within 30 meters, right? It, it's almost a little bit ridiculous to say you can't build anymore because, but if you want to build it back, is there no like grandfathering clause that kind of takes that into account? That, yeah, it's called grandparenting. Right. So anything that's there now is grandparented. Right. But it's not if when it, if it comes to the, like a deck or if you want to change it, that's the, that's what I'm kind of asking Scott here. Is there anything that just takes that into account? This is already developed. Therefore, there's a less of a concern element. There, there isn't. If, if you, there isn't. Yeah, okay. If you want to do something within yeah. that 30 meters, it requires permit. Even though there's a retaining wall, there's all this stuff that's already done. Well, that seems kind of stupid. Deb has Deb? A yeah. Go ahead, Deb. Yeah, so just a couple comments. I agree completely with Ian. Like the, the whole issue, I've always had concerns about grandfather development where you have, it, it's almost like they have to let it deteriorate because they're not allowed to do anything with it. It, it just makes no sense. For, um, but the second point is with regards to Todd's comment about uh, waiting on on the front counter guys um, just you know as as a, a secondary kind of irrelevant comment but kind of supporting his is they told us about uh, three years ago they didn't like a repair we had done to our docks so I said tell me what you want we'll do whatever you want we've been waiting three freaking years and they and I send them every six months I'll say what do you want we want to be compliant and they never have time to get back to us. But they told us it's not good, but they don't have time to get back to us and tell us how they want us to fix it. Okay. Hey, so, just yeah, good points, Deb. Um, really good points. I I, I kind of think, in a, a, and I think because we're a waterfront community and, and, and some of the other places in the Okanagan, I've always said we should have a head lease. And if we were, if we were to acquire a head lease with the province, it would be like having our own tenure and their own tenure would be all the entire community and all the applications would go through the municipality and not have to go through the crown. And that's why we've always said, but it's, it's a little costly to administer. And I know I mean, Jeff and I talked about it lots about, it, you know, trying to get a head lease and, and maybe that's, that's the way we should be looking at it. I know Kelowna has one. I think Penticton has one or, each well, I think we've got to start by changing your bylaws, stating that you guys are going to have all the PPs in the house, right? Mm -hmm. There's no reason it has to go to the to the minister to plenary. There's no reason at all. Yeah, absolutely not. And if you know a QEP signs off on it, there's no reason why this district or council cannot give a variance to the setbacks mm -hmm. for what the QEP states. Um, We've done it before. We did it when I was on council. Uh, so it's been done. It's happening. It's happening today in other uh, jurisdictions. So, you know, I think we need to look after our own waterfront. Yeah. And not have a ministry that's also confused and doesn't even understand what's going on with wrapper, uh, misleading the QEPs and information. Because I, I found out my QEP, who I hired to work on both the lagoon and the channel. And I'm asking them, please provide me the legislation that says the steel lines can't be bent. And they can't find it. They don't have it. Yeah. They have a guideline from Flynn Road. Yeah, no, good points. All good points, Todd. And I, I, I agree. It's, it's, it, you can't wait four years for We got a guy trying to build a deck above his retaining wall that protects it. We're all allowed to have retaining walls through the, it's a, we're allowed to protect our properties from flooding or erosion. Yep. That supersedes any riparian law. As a landowner, yeah, we're allowed to do that absolutely. And so he's behind his retaining wall, and he's getting told by the DOS that he's got to get a permit from Flynnroll to to put a deck on. Like it's ridiculous. I, I agree, I agree. Scott, on another thing, in part of our bylaw and our OCP, we have designated dates that anything like if your deck was built prior to, I can't remember the date. It's it's in our in our thing. Um, you can repair it and you can, you know, as long as you don't disrupt the foundation or something like that. Do you recall that? And, and, and that's in our OCP. I think that's in our OCP, but it's, I don't think it's in our bylaw. Yeah, I don't. And I can't recall 
that particular thing. And in general, you, you know, you could repair a deck and refinish it and everything else, but um, you can't extend, you can't dig any, like you can't disrupt the ground at all. Um, yeah, and it's pretty, it's pretty specific. And, and where it comes from is, is it says the district can't issue any permits without this report being submitted and accepted by the province. So that's in your bio. <clears throat> no, that's the repair and areas protection regulation says a, a municipality cannot issue any permits without this report and being submitted. That's in the gray area of Flinroll downloading their, I guess their assessment on what the repair and area law states. But again, if you want to get back to it, we're not on White Lake and Salmon Arm. That's in, we're on a federal lake. So again, uh, the federal laws, which come all the way back to the repairing area and ahead is what's going to, if this was to go into a court, yeah. it's going to go to that. It's not going to go to what the repairing area of the campus has guidelines proposed. If it, but I think the feds just regulate navigable waters. So that's. They regulate the whole shoe shop lake. If it's navigable. But then once you get to the shore, it does go in a different jurisdiction. No, it's all DFO, up to the high water. Fish habitat. DFO. DFO. Yeah. Development from development next to fish habitat is. Right. That's what my understanding. Yeah. I, I mean, is this just a question about. I, I know a little bit about this. I've worked in alternative energy and we had to do a lot of these studies. And I mean, it's super strict, like, fit, you know, Flinro and they have a, they also have to do the species, you know, the Endangered Species Act. So there's so many different things that get layered on this. But is this just kind of designed to let these buildings rot? Because if you can't do anything, then they've kind of designed the regulations and the protection regulation just to make sure no one does anything to the buildings. No, I, I don't think so. I think you can, you can apply. They're going to, and the QEP is going to come up with, with a setback and tell you what you can and can't do. Um, right. But, but the frustrating <laughs> thing about, about that is that setbacks are already blown to hell. Right. You know? <laughs> there is no setback unless you literally rip down the building. Um, so then that doesn't make any logical sense. So, you know, where the line is, you know, from, you know, your property line and where the, the water starts, you, you can apply to do stuff in the water. So you can apply to put a retaining wall in, you can apply to put a dock in. Um, you know, if your report from your QEP says, you know, your deck is not gonna negatively affect the fish habitat, then, you know, the province might accept the report. So there are things you can, you can do. The, the problem is if you can't do anything that's going to negatively affect fish habitat, that's going to further negatively affect fish habitat. That's that's the thing. And I guess the other problem is just timelines. Timelines. Yeah. Timelines. Which is... Yeah, we'll go ahead. Yeah, just one quick question on the whole issue of acceptance of the QEP. So if the district has to wait for the QEP, the dis, uh, front counter to actually accept the QEP that is submitted. Like, is, is there the possibility of just kind of putting wording in about deemed acceptance so that we're not being held hostage by their never ending timelines in terms of, you know, like within 30 days or whatever, the province is deemed to have accepted this QEP. Because to me, a QEP is like an engineer's uh, report, you know, like it's kind of, if an engineer stamps something, then it's good, you know, like it, it shouldn't be up to, you know, like the uh, the regulators or, or administrators to say that it's not, it's not good enough. So give them a, you know, like give them a deemed timeline in terms of acceptance. So what, what happened in the past was the QEP would do their report and they'd say, oh, it's 15 meter, meter SPIA or a 10 meter SPIA. <clears throat> and, you know, this is going to occur in the SPIA, but they're going to then trade, you know, that, 15 square meter encro encroachment in the SPIA for a 15 meter new tree being planted over here. <clears throat> and it used to be the, the QEP would submit the report. We'd receive it. We know it's submitted. We can issue the permit. And I think it, I think it came from that ombudsman report was it's, it's not working with the QEP just submitting it. 
um, the, the province needs to review it and accept it. So I think with the new, um, so I think it's 2014, between 2014 and 2019, they made those changes. And one of them was, it's no longer just submit the report, the report now has to be accepted. So they tried that. And for some reason, I guess it, it didn't necessarily work. Um, <clears throat> they did introduce something recently where they were going to kind of have this like quick review of them. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a lottery, right? You're submitting, everybody's submitting the reports. Maybe mine will get the quick review. Um, but right now, yeah, there isn't really an opportunity, you know, to do anything until the province mm -hmm. says it's submitted. And, and I've seen them be submitted and accepted in the time I've been here, which is less than two years. I've seen them be created, <laughs> submitted and accepted. So it happened, but it's rare. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Scott, where is that, where is that legislation? Uh, uh, did the province send us a, uh, a letter saying that we have to uh, submit all QEP, QEP reports to them and they have to approve them? Or where is that legislation? That's a repair and areas protection regulation. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's not what there is. It, that's just a guideline that the ministry has passed out to local governments. Okay. The reports. Is that a guideline or a regulation? A guideline. Nothing in repair and area assessments that says all the repair and reports from the QEP have to be approved by be God, when are you getting that appointment for the with the province? Well, I talked to Keith Weir last week and again this week, and so he's setting up the. He wants to get the guys who, because my question to the ministry was, um, why are you telling QEPs that the setback lines can't be moved? Where is that? Where is that in legislation? Where is that in RAR? Yeah. Where is that in the wrapper? It's not even in that new one that came out in twenty nineteen. And so again, it's a guideline that the ministry has set up and has told all the QEPs that you try to hire as a developer or a proponent, and they're like, no, can't touch it. Well, so you know, I'll question that. Well, where does it say that? Where is the specifics? And there is none. It all comes back to the QEP doing the scientific based report. Mm -hmm. That's what all the decision making is based on in the repairing area. Okay. Can I just ask one more question? Sure. Um, in terms of our process with the province, um, so you say we're not allowed to proceed or give a permit without that approval in place. What does that process kind of look like if, say, that didn't happen? If we didn't do that? Yeah. I imagine the province would charge us as, you know, and we'd probably be fined. Well, no, I, I'm, I guess I'm not getting saying we're blatantly ignoring it. No, we're, we're saying within, within our official plan, without, you know, we're doing everything proper. This has a retaining wall. This is clearly not part of a riparian area. You can't have a riparian area with a retaining wall, in my opinion. But I mean, yeah, like at some point, there, there needs to be some sort of common sense and logic in this, right? It, it just, just does. I, I, Obviously, if you're ignoring <laughs> riparian areas, and you obviously that's happening in that area, that's one thing. But if you're going, okay, this has a big concrete retaining wall, and there's a guy put a deck on there, uh, this is not really following. So, I guess the the one thing is is the damage to fish habitat. We want we want to avoid that. Right. Well, let's yeah. just assume so it's behind a big yeah. retaining wall. There's no impact on the fish so habitat. Then let's say. Someone hires a QEP, the QEP comes up with a report, says, hey, whatever this person is doing is not going to damage fish habitat. We'll even say that the report even says, you know, um, it meets the requirements of the province. There's, uh, there's not going to be any damage. They submit it to the province. It's not going through. And our council says, hey, let's issue the development permit anyway. Then a conservation officer with a gun on his hip would show up and serve Kelly uh, um, summons or something to appear in court and a judge would decide the fate, which could be a fine or maybe the judge would say, hey, the repair and areas regulation is so stupid, you guys will give you a pass. I don't know, but that's- Yeah, I don't, I don't agree with that. That's a game, somebody like, 
the Ombudsman report clearly states, which was done in 2021, that the ministry has no legal authority on repairing areas for districts or cities. Stated right in there. I sent that report. Yeah. yeah, I just brought it this morning. So there again, here's this line of, you know, who's right and who's wrong. Um, but I'm pretty sure in the past, when I was on council, the guy knew the dam over up Bear Lake that was going to go into the repairing area. And of course, it was submitted to uh, Front Counter. Front Counter didn't like us approving it, but there's nothing they could do. We all approved it because we went there. It's on the guy's lawn. No one ever gets there. If he's mowing it, and now he's putting a, a deck over top, two feet over top of his lawn. So again, it, it comes back to legalities. It's one government against another government. And so I, I would see, I don't see the scenario that Scott's talking about happening. Um, and that would be a question for, I guess, the lawyers. Well, why don't we do this? Why don't we, why don't we put this on the council agenda and, uh, and maybe we get council to direct uh, staff to, uh, to, to look into it a little bit further, whether it would be the, with the lawyer. Yeah, Kelly just arrived. Uh, I don't know. Oh yeah, no, that's okay. Information. <laughs> oh. Well, I was looking at the repair in areas actually has some information on there in terms of requirements of local government. So, but I think it's the thing is a good idea. Maybe we all need to take a let staff do some more research and get a little bit more understanding here so we can try to try to streamline the process so it is reasonable because it does seem a little extreme to have like again it is very clear that it says QEP and it does say that we need to accept an assessment report from the ministry but it just seems like that process is ridiculously long and is there not a way we can come up with a you know to streamline that but it, it does say in here that we need an assessment report that a local government can issue a development permit uh, without an assessment report from the um, ministry. And the assessment report is based on the QEP. So the QEP is sent to the ministry, and the ministry can either accept it or reject it, and then send us a report saying we accept it. So it does say that in here, but it does seem really long and cumbersome of a process to do things. <laughs> Yeah. Well, Deb, Deb has a good point about, you know, yeah, you send out referrals and they have uh, 30 days or 30, 60, days. 30 days to respond. And if they don't respond, uh, you go ahead and issue the permit, you know, if your staff agrees on it and your council votes on it, whether it be a variance. But the other thing to look at, too, is maybe it's time we really dig into a head lease and we manage and we, you know, we bill out all the foreshore leases and, you know, they bill us for one foreshore lease in the entire area. And then we bill out the individual foreshore leases and approve docks and approve upland permits and everything. It's maybe it's time we do that. And I think you know the submitting it to the ministry wouldn't be an issue if the ministry returned it for the days, right? It's just it goes into this pit of right, and you have no guarantee. So that's that where there's a flaw, right? How can you work on getting that? Is a good word for it, a pit. Is bottomless pit. <laughs> okay, so yeah, just just on the head lease. So the riparian areas regulation doesn't apply to the water, right? So it applies to the development on the land next to the water. So the head lease would be for the water, for docks, and for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how much leeway it's going to be in these riparian areas. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Oh yeah, well, why don't we do that? Why don't we, you know, uh, bring it to council and we can, like you say, council can. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. I mean, I guess the real question is why does it take more than thirty days? I, I think that. I mean, this is happening more and more. I mean, we're coming up against numerous regulations, whether it's federal, provincial, and it just, it gums everything up, right? What should be a fairly simple thing, especially when it comes to like endangered species, riparian habitat, all of these things are kind of designed to 
well, they're purposely designed to actually lower development on all these areas. That's that's the purpose of them. And ultimately that's what it's kind of achieving. But you know, at what point as local government, we could say, hey, we gave you a chance to review this. You didn't. And you know, screwing anyways, right? Because at some point you can't just say, well, I'm ignoring my duties. Uh, just put it on the desk and let it rot and then say you have a right to enforce this stuff. I, I, at some point, if they're going to have these levers that they want to control, they actually have to do them in a proper process and, and letting it rot for two years isn't a proper process from them. And I know what they'll say. They'll say, well, we don't care. But at some point, then we might have to decide if we want to push back on that and say, no, you, you kind of need to care. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, I think we're all on the same page. We just got to figure out how to do it. So uh, I think we'll uh, we'll do that. We'll we'll put it on the agenda for next uh, Wednesday and see if we can move move forward and learn a little bit more. Okay. Anybody else have anything else on waterfront development? Pauline, you were going to say something. You're going to. So where are we with this deck? Like, are we going to wait until we take all of this stuff? I mean, the deck's on the lawn. The deck's going out on the lawn. Oh, not in a riparian area. So back to where does common sense prevail here? Wait for us. Have they done this PA? I don't think we're going to get arrested for putting Have they hired the QEP? Yeah, we've hired the QEP to do a whole assessment on the lagoon. Um, and uh, talking to her yesterday, um, you know, she stated that, yeah, it's low, fish impact. Yeah, that looks like it's low, fish impact on all the mapping for, around the lake. Um, so, you know, they're, they're happy. We'll get this report and give it to you, and then we can see if you guys still want to talk to the chief minister or not. We'll do that. You guys will be satisfied with that? Well, I'll get the QUP report, give it to you guys. If you guys are satisfied with it, maybe you can issue the development permit for his deck. And then, the, for the ministry. but that follows in, does, you know, it's not in the development permit area. I know. So I don't even know why we're asking for this. Like, it doesn't make any sense. To me. You guys have one point that says it's got to be in the water course development area. And we're not even in that map and we're making us jump through these hoops that are part of the process. So I, I don't is that, understand. Is that in the OCP? Not take this on the It's got you know any of those have been part of that. I don't know. I don't know why it's not part of the map, but any it's 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 the wording is anything within 30 meters of water course. So even though it's not on the map. It's gray area, it's a <laughs> lot. It's so I mean there's lots, you know. You're in a water course area when you want to do work in a lake, you're supposed to give a section eleven. We don't need a section of to work because it's a man-made lake. No, because because the management plan has you've got permission through the management plan. That's right, and we've got permission for docks. We've got permission for the building. We've got permission for everything around the lagoon through the management plan. So I don't know why we're dealing with the Ministry of Glenrow on a deck. And Scott, have you reviewed the management plan? Have you seen the management plan? Like, would that satisfy you to say, hey, these guys got a management plan and they're following it? No, the management plan is, is for that lot 46. So it's for the water. Um, but the repair and errors regulations applies to everything development next to lot 46, essentially. <laughs> Pretty gray, isn't it? <laughs> Well, okay. Let's uh, let's wait for your QEP, and in the meantime, we'll see if we can talk talk it over at council and and uh, maybe before then. Great. Okay. All right. Lord, I don't know. Is it on the agenda about the rescue society chat? Uh, that's gonna. It, it's not. It was gonna be on the agenda, but it's put on uh, council agenda for next Wednesday, right, Kelly? Yeah, it's more of a council discussion discussion. Okay. All right. Anything else? We can move on. All right. Item number C: AALR lands. Um, I asked uh, Kelly and Scott to put this on the agenda, 
and uh, more so to just basically take a look at our AL, AL, ALR lands and um, and uh, just kind of you know take a look at our commercial our commercial properties, our industrial properties, and uh, if you really take a look at our map, our ALR map, we're you know we do we don't have a lot of commercial land uh, to be able to expand on. And uh, Scott's provided a map. And I, I just kind of went, when it was able to go through it there last night. Is that the map of the ALR properties around? Yeah. yeah that's all the ALR land. Yeah. yeah, so I wanted to bring it up as a conversation um, uh, to see if we can, you know, take a look at some of our ALR land. And, and I know we've been trying to get some out for a campground. Go to that map in the OCP, Stephanie. That's probably the best one. Yeah, that one. And maybe you can just give us a recap there, Scott. So this is essentially the all the land that's in the, the agriculture land reserve, and um, and then there's like a it's, and there's a growth management boundary. So um, this uh, plan was being developed. Um, there were a couple of different properties that were also being considered to be removed from the the land reserve. Um, so I think um, on Hillier Road, there's where the Voice for Toys storage is, and then um, Parks Hill, that subdivision, which maybe even doesn't even show up on this map as being outside the ALR. Oh, no, it does. No, I think it does, yeah. yeah. So what, what, you know, when those applications are being considered and when the OCP is being considered, you work with uh, the uh, Agriculture Land Commission and part of their um, their recommendation or their requirement was that we we prepare a growth management boundary and we draw a line around the town to say this is this is where we develop and once and the, the theory is once all that land is developed then you start looking at going outside the growth management boundary and that's because sorry that's because they said well you have more developable land why would we take stuff out of the land reserve to do this when you actually have it exactly where I got. Scott, do we have a good idea of the properties in the community that have been a, just recently in the last 20 years been removed from the ALC develop on and they haven't developed on? Like I know, I, th I think um, Gary or, or this property was removed from the ALC, Ram, Rams. So the Parksville one? The Parksville, yeah. Yep. It's, they're supposed to have some affordable housing component and is there any? So so the condition of removing that property from the, the land reserve was, and that's a condition from the, the land commission is that there, there'll be a affordable housing component. So I think they'd get a certain density. So they'd get, I think it's 92 lots. So they'd get 92 residences, residential units in there and 10 of them, have to be affordable, like in like under the blanket of affordable housing. Um, so that that was that requirement for that particular property. Um, as far as a list of land being excluded recently, like you know, I think we could figure that out pretty easily. So what has changed just recently? I'll say within the last three or four years is it used to be you know you own a piece of land, you can apply to the land commission to get excluded and. <clears throat> and then the, the land commission considers that now it's changed. Only the municipality can apply to have land excluded, and and municipalities or other levels of government can apply to have land excluded. So that um, individual no longer has that opportunity. They'd have to kind of make a case with the the municipality, and the municipality would have to put it forward on their behalf. Um, so on this map, it's, um, if you look at the Eagle River, um, just across from um, Silver Sands and Sikmu Sands, um, th those two properties have been excluded. So the, that one and then the one just on the other, yeah, that one. So those two have been excluded. Um, although they got permission to be excluded, although the paperwork hasn't been finalized that they're actually out of the, the ALC. Out of the LR, so. 
Okay, and if we have any more interest of any other properties there to uh, request being pulled out of the ALCs or even access to those properties? Um, so we have had, like, so we were working with, with Bryant and, and for the properties next door to that um, to, to have a non-farm use to campground. Um, I think it was access through that property of campground on the, the properties that have been excluded um, and that was denied. Um, I can't think of anybody who's actually said, I want to exclude my property, but we have had people along the highway mostly. Um, and then, yeah, even it, like kind of next to the street, streets and stuff are there where people have had ideas um, and for subdivisions or for non-farm uses. Um, and really the advice has been like, you know, you have to commission and and the land commission is not, not allowing it to happen. It used to be, you have to show, you have to prove that whatever you're doing is not gonna negatively affect farming. Now it's, you have to show what you're doing has a positive impact on farming. So it, it's, it's changed the criteria. The commission can always make a decision, but that's the criteria they're using now to consider applications. So it's, it's very difficult. I think Deb has her hand up. Okay, Deb, go ahead. Just a question, Scott, in, um, in the top right corner, it's off the map now, um, or, um, but in the top right corner, yeah, um, I've, I've got that little piece of property and I have no intention of changing it, but I thought I heard that there was plans to do some subdivision um, of one of the properties there in terms of the water servicing and different things. This was a few years ago, but it still is within that ALR. Um, just wondering, maybe I'm remembering wrong, but I thought there was something about putting some more uh, lots or something in there. Not, and I, I haven't spoken to anybody about that, so. Yeah, I think it predated you, but it's just, I, I know when they were putting the water services in and stuff, and I was hearing some stuff at the time about, you know, like somebody was adding some lots or planning to add some lots there, but okay. Okay, well, uh, well Brian, you go ahead. I know you're. I'm just wondering why uh, that red line was a growth management boundary. Why it isn't around another piece of this south of the railway. Uh, and, and across. Okay, got up too quick. So right in here, right? So the, the, and I would say probably those are outside of the growth or within the growth management or outside. So those would probably be identified as having opportunity to, to be excluded or to be developed. Well, one of the things I thought about too is, and Kelly and I briefly talked about, there's some huge tracts of land that are, aren't being farmed and aren't being, aren't being um, developed. And uh, some of them are in the LR, or some some of them are out of the LR. So it's just you know it's just conversation. To I thought it would be good to you know see where we're at with the ALC on 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 those two lots over there and access to the act more access, and um, and just wanted to know if the district had 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 any requests for anybody to want to pull some more land out for access to that to that property. And I don't see it, I guess. Nobody's nobody's requested. Uh, well, I think um, there was an appeal process for the decision. Um, and I think it's timed out now. I, and I think, Council, you met with um, the LC at UBCM and, and talked about it. Um, but I don't think any, I don't think any decisions are made or any changes have occurred, but if somebody wanted to do it, we'd have to make a new application to the province. Okay. Kelly, do you have any, uh, can, you, can you recall? Yeah, no, I spoke to Kim when we were there. So so Brian's property is it's now out, is it now out of the ALR, that portion? No, so these two are out. Okay, those two are out. Yeah, right. So, so talking to Kim and I didn't send her an email to follow up, I just have to connect it. 
supposed to be in November. Uh, but see that for an access permit, there is an easier way to to get access. I can't remember what the name was, but we did talk when we were at UCM. We were going to follow up. It didn't seem to be such a. It didn't seem to be a huge thing. It wouldn't be like another whole application. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's in the works, anyways. Okay. Great. Right. Um, do we know? <clears throat> I think one of the problems I always have with ALR land is it's, first of all, it's ridiculous. Most of it's not actually farmed. I mean, th there's no distinction between what is a floodplain and what is farmland. <laughs> but is there any indication within our ALR how many people are actively farming those areas? Or do we have any sense of that? Um, yeah, I, I don't really have any sense of it right. looking at a map, but we could. We can look into it. Really, what they when they created the LR was kind of like you know, sixty thousand feet. Yeah, this looks flat from the space, and this looks like the soils are good for it. Yeah, but you know they're probably off by twenty five percent accuracy, right? So yeah, a lot of good farmland isn't included, and a lot of really bad farmland is included. And it used to be you could, well, still you you know if you brought a case saying hey this this the soil and whatever conditions don't allow for farming, you know, you may be successful in getting it out or getting your non-farm use, but it's it's difficult. It's a lot of time and money. Yeah, <clears throat> and a lot of it's held just because for tax purposes, it's a lot easier to hold that much land with a with a tax rate on ALR land. Well, just yeah, point of discussion was kind of you know, talk about Bryant's property and also anything along the highways. You know, it's, you know, you look at all our commercial is pretty much used up, and, but we still not have any people building commercial buildings, but it's just something to think about in the future of all that highway corridor area is all ALR land and it's, uh, some's being farmed and some's not, but it's just a conversation I thought we'd start, uh, start to get uh, moving. Well, and maybe to add to that, I mean, if we are going to have this ALR land, then maybe it's going to be, should be used for agriculture. I mean, that's that's always been my issue, is if you are going to have this set aside, then activate it, use it, right? And that also adds to a community, but that just doesn't happen with ALR land. And I guess that's, I've had lots of experience with this, trying to get useless piece of lands out of ALR, and then they just don't do it. At some point, I mean, especially for a community, this impacted with being totally surrounded by ALR land, you have to have, there has to be some sort of justification as to why they're not letting land that's clearly not been farmed for years. I mean, we have uh, out, right? Like we have that same problem the district does with the dog park. Um, you know, there, there's just so many numerous examples. I don't know how we would convince ALR to, to loosen some of those regulations, but I think it's something we should be getting into a bigger conversation with the province about, because right here, the map tells us everything we need to know. We're constrained not only by ALR land, but we're also constrained by Ministry of Transportation. Like, it, it seems like... And the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. And the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, for me? Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say more more to Ian's point. Um, yeah, I agree, but I'm I'm thinking sometimes you know it's like uh, Scott had made a comment about you have to show how it what you're doing is uh, actually making farmland better as opposed to not impacting negatively on it. And on Ian's point to you know like actually mapping out what is actively being used and and maybe doing some tracking and promoting. You know, like I'll, I'll yeah. use Jeff. Jeff is an example, you know, like he really started to farm that piece he had. And there's the people that are doing the distillery east of town and, and such like um, and farming for that. You know, maybe if there's ways that we're actually saying this is how we're promoting agriculture in our community, maybe that's a way of getting the ALC more on site. Yeah, good point. Good point. Uh, Okay, well, we'll wait. Uh, we'll wait to see if Kelly gets in a response from Kim, and uh, and uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll keep poking at it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anybody else have anything else? Nothing. 
Okay, well, I wanted to thank everybody for coming and uh, I guess we'll call this meeting adjourned and have a mover. Ian, seconder Deb, uh, adjourned at uh, 10 15. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Now that, Thanks. that it's adjourned, Gordon, Ian, I just wanted to mention to you because I thought you guys would both be concerned, but mom fell and broke her hip yesterday. <laughs>